see here. So hi everyone. It's Tabitha Jane here. Let me see. Okay, I think that we've got I think we've got everything going just right. I um I'm looking at this swing here. And it reminds me of um of a time way back when when I got divorced and I had my little well, it's kind of like a castle kind of thing. It was really cool. Um, condo in the middle of nowhere on one side was this golf course and the other was this nature preserve and I was just so full of emotion and whatnot that I would just get up and not even think twice about it and just go run and I would run through the nature preserve by myself and um, just go and I there was this clearing and there was this swing and I would just sit on that swing and just, just swing. Like, forget about what great exercise swinging is. Not in that way, you bunch of weirdos. Did you know that the upside down pineapple is the symbol for swingers? So if somebody has that like on their shirt or a bumper sticker and they're like, hey, do you want to hang out? They're asking if you want to swing. And you're like, um, let me see the other person I'd be swinging with before I seal the deal. You know what I mean? But I'll, let's just be honest. I mean, I don't think that I've seen an attractive swinger couple. You know, you see them and, you know, you're like, ooh, ooh. Anyway, anyway, swings and swingers and all that good stuff on Thanksgiving. So I'm, I'm getting better. It's really, really slow and coming but as I approach the three month mark of me being sick I think it's turning around. I was really going through um, days where I was sleeping 15 to 18 hours a day and still just so tired and um, my doctor just says that you know it's like I've got long COVID syndrome again and I'm just so sick of being sick but we're back on the countdown then so we've got you know what my, my surgery if it doesn't get canceled again because I can't get COVID again, right? Right? Hopefully. Um, then we're back on the almost two weeks before my rotator cuff surgery. So I got to get some recordings in so you guys know that, you know, you'll have something to listen to because I'm probably going to be knocked out for a little while. So... I want to talk about the headlines because it's been so long since I've talked to you guys and I'm so sorry. Um, I just, I'm always, I always feel so guilty for how nice you guys are to me. And I feel like I always want to be worthy of your time and support. And so when I'm feeling half-assed, I, I don't want to um, create content that may not be my best because like I say and I mean I cherish each and every one of you and I'm getting better about getting caught up on my emails and comments I mean it's like I tell you I, I don't want to ever like not give you my full attention like when I read an email that is like me sitting down with a nice cup of coffee and a good friend I want to answer the emails like that's what we're doing and I know that as a collective community, we are really, really making progress in finding the truth. And so I want to talk about the Twats, Watts Island. I want to go to Wattsville. Um, and I want to close with Wattsville so I can get another chapter out of our book, Knocked Out, because after my book, I've got a few other books I want to read, right? But I want to read the discovery with my commentary. You guys think you guys could handle it? 
and I can't tell, but I think I might have my hot little hands on the original unredacted discovery. So I want to do Watts to tie things up it, with the book and go to a couple of other news stories that I'm really watching and researching. And I have to tell you, some of these are really on my mind. And I keep trying to talk with my husband and he finds no interest in my true crime obsession. He starts walking out of the room fast, acts like he has to go to the bathroom, you know, all that stuff. Looks at me weird, runs, pretends like he's sleeping, all that, all this weird stuff. I'm like, no, I got to talk to you because I need to figure this out because this is not my concerns. Okay? And that's, that's where we go with it. So, oh man, what in the F happened with that poor, beautiful girl named Sean Sean Kella? Do I say Sean Kella? I just, I don't get it. She went down to Cabo San Lucas. Now, all bets are off when you're out of the country, number one. Number two, you go to Cabo, and when it used to be that our only real in-depth news coverage would come from Dateline. Yeah, they'd find piles of dead bodies, and those are tourists. And it's because there is absolute lawlessness down there. And the way the story looks like it's going, is that a few friends went down and Sean Killer was, I, I'm not saying it right. It's like S-H-O-N-Q-U-I-L-A, I think. I don't have my notes there. It's just, I've been looking into it a lot. I'm just really disturbed by it because she went down with her friends and I don't know how there's this video camera that shows what they were doing in their room, but you know, it comes out and it shows like they were, um, you know, trying on swimsuits and stuff. And you could tell that the friends were treating her differently. Now, she has some incredible pictures. I don't know the backstory if she's into modeling or whatnot. She sure should have been. But I mean, she's got this one picture where she looks right, right as beautiful as Tyra Banks, just right up there. Um, but she went down there with some friends and or whatever the hell you want to call them. And they called her mom after a few days down there and told her mom that she died of alcohol poisoning. That, you know, she just got too drunk and what do you know? Hmm. Yep. Well, this video has surfaced and it is so bad. And I'm going to put it up on my community page. The newest video that just came up. Um, it's disturbing. So I'm going to warn you guys. So what, what happens in this is you see her sitting on the floor, like flat on the floor. Legs are kind of apart. So she's just sitting there and her head is down. And this other chick is beating the holy living hell out of her head and everything in her head is just going down like a rag doll and the way that she's sitting is really suspect that she may have already been knocked out when she was being hit that hard again and I mean this chick was just I have never seen such aggressiveness in a real fight because like you want to say, Oh, you've seen that. No, you haven't seen it. You've seen things on TV that are fight scenes that aren't real. You know, even a Hollywood slap isn't real, right? This was real. So I do believe that they have 
done an arrest now. It's down in Cabo, okay? So in that same time period where I was post-divorce, right before I was remarried, because I, I was engaged before I was divorced. I was, you know, I, I'm a very good wife, apparently, and these men just couldn't keep themselves from trying to put a ring on it. I'm like, well, hold, hold on, people. I need some time. I, I'm not wife material, but so I went down to Cabo in that time period and I bought myself a condo, paid cash. It's like, why not? I come down here once a year as it is. Why not have a condo? It made sense, kind of. Probably not really. See, the thing about the timeshares is, you know, the, as soon as you get off the airplane, like they set it up and you go down to Cabo and you're like, all right, I'm in Mexico. Wow. And then it's like, there's no one in the airport. And you're like, um, is there any taxis? Um, no, the taxis all closed and everything. Well, um, I need to get out to this hotel. Is this nearby? Oh yeah. That's like an hour away. Um, yeah. So how, how do you do this with a taxi? You just said there's any taxi. Yeah, there's not. And then some nice looking person will come around the corner and be like, Hey, um, I hear you need a ride. And, you know, I've, I've got a cab, you know, last cab, um, definitely could give you a ride out there. Would you, um, in lieu of paying anything, would you go to a timeshare presentation in the morning? You know, it'll pay for all your entertainment when you're there. I mean, all you have to do, I mean, because if you have to wait now, you'll have to wait till the morning. You'll have to sleep in this airport. You have to wait till the morning. And then you'll probably have to pay 100 bucks for a cab. So, you know, if you just do this, I mean, it's free breakfast anyway. I mean, in timeshare, they have a really good breakfast. They have this enchilada casserole. And I want to know how to make this freaking enchilada casserole because I don't know how. But I went to several timeshare presentations just so I could get the enchilada casserole. So you're like, hey, it's it's great. It's a win-win, right? And then it's going to pay for my entertainment anyway, right? So, bought the damn timeshare. Timeshare looks okay on paper, but what they don't tell you is the maintenance fee. And the day that you sign the contracts, you're already $500 behind in your maintenance. So then you have to pay the amount for the condo and the maintenance fee. And then, oh, what do you know, like two two months later, then it's you're paying for the maintenance fee again, another $500. Because, oh, that one was because you were already late for that one in there. And the maintenance fee alone would be about what you pay for when you go down and get deals and whatever, right? So anyway, yeah, I, I was a sucker and bought a condo. And so when I went back down to use it, I went down with, um, I was, so I went back down the next year. So I was already married and um, I was about four months pregnant. And I went down with my sister and my aunt. Um, my husband was in the Navy and at sea. So I was like, okay, kill some time. And this, you know, why not? So, go down there. Same spiel. I'm staying at a resort with my condo that I got. And, well, you know, you get to the airport and it's the same old spiel. All the cabs aren't there. Whatever. Well, my aunt and my sister are there. We're like, okay, yeah, let's get the free breakfast. And then I'll pay for our entertainment. No problem. Well, we're three single women down there. And every time that I had went down to Cabo before, I had went with, you know, a man or my, my ex-husband, you know, or, or with male friends, whatever. But there was always a male presence around me. And um, this time there was not. And we went to the timeshare thing. And the guy who gave us like this golf cart ride to the presentation, you know, my sister, my aunt got off the golf cart and he, the dude leans over cause I was in front and they're in the back and he tries to freaking French kiss me. And it was just crazy. Cause here I am pregnant, you know, obviously married and pregnant. And I mean, it was like, he tried to stick his tongue down my freaking throat and 
I went to go and complain about him and they wouldn't hear it. You know, they just ignored it and ignored it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And um, they said that, you know, well, um, you know, if, if you're not satisfied, then, you know, you're not going to go to this and everything. And my sister and my aunt are like, okay, just shut up so we can get the free food and everything. I'm like, this dude just tried to freaking stick his tongue down my throat. And it's like, they started acting really hostile around me. And I heard this um, chick call me a fat bitch and everything. I'm going, what? And whoa. And I mean, it was really scary. And, um, I kind of dropped the issue and I was a little bit more, you know, careful to not let myself be alone with any man, you know, <laughs> um, even in a golf cart. But, um, they drove us, I, I went a different driver, a couple of days later and they made a different turn from where we were supposed to go. We knew we were just going down the street and they did this other thing and they said they needed to um, go and get some paperwork or something. And they took us to this place and it was like off the condominium area, the resort area. And this um, building they went to had all of these guys with machine guns on top of the roof and they kept the machine guns fixed on us while this guy ran into this building to get whatever paperwork he needed. And I thought, okay, great. I'm going to be in the pile of tourists in the next Dateline story. This is, this is how my life is going to end because I'm apparently an idiot and didn't watch the Datelines close enough to, you know, really understand that it wasn't just or the headlines, it freaking happens. I'm going, God, what? And I was so freaked out. And my aunt, my sister went out, you know, to go to Jets King. And I just freaked the fuck out. And I just called the airlines. And I got the next airplane ride out of Cabo. And left my sister and an aunt a note. And I'm like, enjoy my condo. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> And I did. And that's the thing, because I was pregnant, so I wasn't drinking. And they were drinking a lot. And so they weren't as bothered about the whole thing. But that's that's Cabo. And if you stay on your resort and do not leave the resort, you're probably okay. But always keep, if you're a lady, keep a man with you. Um, if you're a girl and you've got another girl with you, just honestly, just don't turn your back to each other. It's, it's really scary. I never went back to Mexico. I sold my condo for a fraction of what I bought it for. I, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, and, and there are so many, you know, really sad stories of tourists and stuff that, um, have lost their lives. I mean, it's, it's Mexico. You forget about that because you get down there and it's so beautiful and whatnot. And that's where I just feel so bad for this poor girl because she's down there and she thinks she's with her friends. And they were not her friends. Like I say in the other video, even when they're trying on swimsuits, they're, they're being really mean girlish to her. And... They all were obviously in a story where they told the mom that she died of alcohol poisoning. And it sounded like the authorities weren't going to look into it because they don't want more negative publicity. And like I say, the way that she was beaten, it was horrifying. This girl was not fighting back. <coughs> she was unable to fight back. <coughs> Excuse me. She, like I said, I don't even think she was conscious. And this chick, like I said, was just on her, just pummeling her. Well, that's my thing here. I was like, well, if this other video wouldn't have surfaced, would we know what happened? And how and why was this other video taken? The point of view from the video camera is up like in the corner of the room so you can see all the activity, you know, going on in the room itself. So it's, it's going to be interesting. And I'm sure that there's another creator who's probably, you know, given all of these details and I just 
am not quite up to date because I've been so busy with everything else and I'm just trying to come back to life. You know how it goes. So I'm going to post that video and please heed my warning. Be really careful if you go to Mexico. Stay, stay in your resort. Don't go anywhere. Just, just be careful, please. Please, please, please. So I've shared with you all that I am from, originally from Washington State. So where I was born is a town called Spokane, Washington. Some of you guys know where that's at. Spokane is very close to Idaho. So the closest, Spokane and, and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, they're just a hop, skip, and a jump. You get on the highway right next to Dick's. Dick's Restaurant, if you don't know, is like the freaking best place. Well, okay, it's in and out Burger is the freaking best, but Dick's, okay? You go get a bag of Dick's is what you do, right? Bunch of bag of Dick's to get my jokes here, but I'm serious. That's what y'all do. There's there's this restaurant called Dick's. It's just so freaking, freaking good. And I just grew up on that. It's, just, it's like this all, um, it's all takeout. And it's one of those places that's, you know, lit up and open till, you know, like probably 2 or 2.30 in the morning. They have one in Seattle. I think they have a couple in Seattle, but it's different than the original one in Spokane. And you get a bag of Dick's burgers. And uh, so you get on the highway right next to Dick's. And then you're in Coeur d'Alene and Moscow isn't too far. And so when they're talking about the horrible tragedy of the four college students that were murdered. I just, I feel like they could have been my friends. You know, they, they're just, they're obviously the age of my kids. I, I just, I don't understand how this could have happened. And it's just surreal to me to watch my, you know, my old stomping grounds, my home and the news stations that I watched growing up as a kid. You know, I, I remember watching on creme TV as Mount St. Helens blew and that was in 1980. And I looked outside and it got dark in the afternoon and it looked like it was snowing and it was May. And I went and told my hippie parents. I think I've already told you guys the story, but went and told my hippie parents. I'm like, it's snowing outside. And they're like, shut up and leave us alone. I'm like, no, it's snowing. Come and look. And then the TV started t talking about what was going on, but you know, they didn't have radars and they didn't have the news cycle. So there was really no warning for what was coming our way. When Mount St. Helens blew that came down. So like Mount St. Helens was down in Oregon and it, so when it exploded, the ash came up all over Washington state. And I, I don't remember how far it all went, but that was it. And it was like May 18th, 1980. So but it was up to your knee and ash and it was ruining people's motors and you'd have the fire trucks coming by and they would try and be putting water on to kind of get it wet. And, you know, people complain about wearing masks. Now well, we had to wear masks, but we had to wear the, the ones with all the filters and stuff. And it was getting inside of our houses, you know, through the heat system and everything. You could not leave your house. You couldn't get food. I mean, it was, it was so much worse than the pandemic and they didn't op reopen schools, you know, for the rest of the year. The volcanic ash has really made um, for good gardening and stuff because of all the minerals. But I just remember watching Krem and, and watching the, the Seattle stations and everything. And then this weekend is actually the Apple Cup. And so I went over with my friends a couple of times over to... Um, Wazoo Washington State University. So I've not been on the University of Idaho campus per se, but I've been on um, Washington State Universities, and it's it's the same where you have that Greek life thing. And so 
Moscow is not too far from Wazoo. All of those college kids and all of the college people in they would intermingle, not like not like their next door neighbors or anything, but you know, if there's an hour between and whatnot, they all know each other, they all party, they all so for Apple Cup, people would come from other colleges and whatnot and that Greek life and so the parties. We went to a couple in the sorority houses themselves. And you can't walk across the room. People are so close to each other that I mean you're you're almost touching and everybody's drunk and high and you can just smell weed and people are making out and hooking up all over and it just I'm short. I'm very short. So I had to learn quick to breathe in when I could and exhale when I could because there were some tall guys and stuff and they were farting really bad because they were so drunk with the cheap beer and everything and I kept, you know, eating their farts and I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. And of course I wasn't drinking because I was the one with a child so I wasn't going to get a drunk driving conviction or anything else. You know, I drove my friends over and, you know, babysat them while they partied and then drove them back home, you know, like three in the morning. But, um, I mean, that's how those parties are over there. And Moscow is a town of 20,000, I think, you know, give or take a few people, right? 11,000 of those go to University of Idaho. So you have a very small town. You have campus police and you have the city police. The murder of four beautiful people in the prime of their life with no criminogenic nature themselves. These were good, clean, smart, healthy kids. 20, call kids, in the prime of their lives. So you go, how did of them get slaughtered? The house is across the street from the college in the way that they describe it. And this house is one that was renovated to rent out to college students. And so it was rented out to six girls, they say. Okay. And it's a home, they say, is three levels. Oh. Of the deceased. There are three girls and one guy. The guy, Ethan, was a, or was a sorority member. And so he, um, he was staying over with his girlfriend, Zanna. And Zanna and Ethan were in one bedroom. Okay? Zanna held the lease. So she was the one on the lease. And the other five were her roommates. So... Two of them, two of her roommates were murdered. They were in another room. So in two of the bedrooms, these murders happened. Okay. So that is four people. There were six girls living in that house. Okay. There were two other girls living in that house that slept through the murder of four young adults, their friends, their roommates. How? How? Well, they say that the home was three stories and the room in which the, the two rooms in which two were murdered in 
were each on the second and third stories. So I think the two girls were on the very top. And they had been best friends forever. And they look like sisters. They're, they're just the, the two most gorgeous little blonde cheerleader, beautiful girls. You see their pictures of their proms and everything. And they got these beautiful like McDougal dresses, you know, just built up on top of just the rhinestone bodices. And you just, your heart just breaks. So I think that they were on the third floor. If I'm right, I could be wrong. They're, either they were on the second or third floor, the two girls, okay, that had been friends forever, college together, blah, 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 blah. On the second floor is where Ethan and Zana were. Like I say, I could be wrong with second or third. I'm in that, you know, whatever. Which left the basement. So you go into the house. There's a basement, main floor, and then third. I guess this is the way it's going to be one, two, three, that way. They're saying that the two that were not harmed were in the basement. Now, I had first heard reports that the two that were unharmed and did not hear four people being murdered in the house that they were in a garage area that was separated from the rest and soundproofed. Now that sounds kind of different. Okay. So the 911 call came in and said that they felt that somebody was unconscious. So the, the 911 dispatch sent an ambulance because they felt there's somebody unconscious. They will not release that 911 call, which I don't know why. I, I don't know if that's, you know, 911 coding where, you know, if, if somebody called and they were screaming and saying that their roommate wouldn't wake up or whatever, and the dispatcher puts in unconscious person. You know, we, we don't know. And maybe the reason they're holding on to the 911 call is because quite possibly, quite possibly it's bone chilling. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have done in their situation. Now, the way that it's coming out is that the girls called over some of their friends. So I don't know if they couldn't open the door or something and they called somebody to say, hey, can you open the door? But I don't know because my spirit animal, Nancy Grace, stated that the crime scene is similar to that of what the crime scene was from Ted Bundy. Now, Ted... You know, Ted, he was your basic serial killer, charming, had a ruse for everything. He was Ted. I lived in the land of Ted. I had always gone to Snohomish Park when I moved over to the Seattle area, you know, and that's one of the places where he got one of his victims. And you know, there's always Volkswagens in the Seattle area, you know, so Ted blended in. And that's why no one could find who Ted was. You know, there were there was obviously a serial killer, and it was Ted. <sighs> Ted, well, side note, do you guys know this, that Ted volunteered for a suicide hotline? He sat next to Anne Rule, one of the best authors, I feel. He sat next to her and volunteered on a suicide hotline. Huh? Crazy, and I guess he was great at listening. So you had Ted in this area, you know, and he was a serial killer. And, you know, because of COVID brain and time and whatnot, I can't remember exactly. I thought he was in jail for a while and then got out somehow. And that's when he went on the rampage and he did the um, the sorority girl. He went in the sorority girl's um, house and did he murder four girls there too? I think it was four. Um just absolutely slaughtered them. So, early in the discussions of the Idaho Four, 
People were talking about Ted Bundy. They were like, this is like what Ted Bundy did when he did this in Florida, when he was a Chi Omega house, I think, when he did that. So then, you know, your mind goes, okay, so had there been a serial killer and he followed one of the girls home and went on a rampage possibility, okay? And then everybody says the Amanda Knox thing and gosh, I still don't know how I feel about that one. For a long time, I thought she was really innocent. And now I don't, I don't know. She's got a different personality. She's real different. Really hard to read. I, I see why what happened to her happened because she's just, I don't know if you say stoic. Both of those come up. So the police did a good thing. I think it was right in the first day of it. They said, we don't know what we're doing here. We're a small town. We don't have crime. We are in over our heads. We don't know what we're doing. And we want to stand down and let the FBI handle this. Kudos. Amazing. Great. Awesome. Much respect. Okay? And they did. And, and the FBI came out in force. And I think they said they've sent FBI agents from three different states. I think. I don't have my notes right now. I'm sorry. I was kind of, kind of like halfway going to do a, a recording and then halfway not. And my notes are on the other side of the house and I'm sorry. So my brain is just not firing on all, cind all cylinders. So I'm sorry. I think, I think they said there's 22 or 24 FBI agents that came out of three different districts, I think is what they said. So they've got 22 to 24 FBI agents there. Now, Right away in the first press conference, they said the community is not under th a threat. There is no threat to the community. So people are like, oh, all right. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, now, you know, I think on the 10th day, people are going, um, we're not sure why they said that, but we don't know who did this at this point. And so there are bigger voices that are coming out saying there is a threat to the community. This person is at large. And who knows what they're going to do before they're caught. Because if they know that they're going to be caught, what's stopping them from going to all the people they might have on their, on their list? You, you don't know. So I feel that was premature, but they were trying to stop mass hysteria. So you have to say, okay, okay, I get it. We're, what, 11, 12 days in now, and they will not release that FB, that 911 tape. They keep getting asked about that, and they're, they're not going to do it. And they're going, well, are you not releasing it because you think that the other two are suspects? They're going, no, we don't think that. So we don't know why they haven't released that. Well, even though the police said we're in over our heads... The news story came out like day two, day three, and it said that the local police screwed up the crime scene, that what they did or didn't do could be deleterious to the entire investigation. Okay. What I see happened for them to say that so boldly is that. The crime scene, they put crime scene tape outside of the house and it was not too far extended. In front of the house is the parking lot kind of area. A week to 10 days in, they expanded that crime scene and they pushed it all the way over to the entire edge of the parking lot and to the surrounding 
tree foresty area behind it, which is wise because you don't know if this person laid in wait, hid in the trees, ran out into the back out into the trees. You don't know. That's where I think that they're saying that crucial evidence could have been lost. The victim's cars were there. The other two roommates' cars were there, and they, you know, obviously could not go back into their house, so they left. Well, what if they ran over a piece of evidence? Don't know. When they were leaving the house, were they touching the doorknobs and whatnot, messing up potential prints? Who knows? So that's where I, I believe that is. And then um, a lot of students just got out of there. They just heard the news and put the pedal to the metal, hit that I-90, went and grabbed a bag of dicks and went and munched. They have a whammy burger there too. Similar to a Whopper, but much better and more mustard. You gotta go to Dick's. You gotta. And then in the in the Riverfront Park, they've got the garbage goat. And it's this this vacuum operated goat thing that looks like a goat. And you you there goes my washing machine. I gotta go fight with that in a little bit. But yeah, so what's really fun as a kid because it makes you wanna grab all the garbage you can because then you wanna bring it to the garbage goat. And so when you go over, you wanna go to the park for the day, you go over and you get a bag of dicks and you sit there and you have a picnic lunch with your bag of dicks and have your hamburgers and fries, a whopper, I mean, a whopper, a whammy. Oh, they made these little good pizzas too and they had shrimp on them too. I love shrimp pizza. So you put your bag from dicks in the garbage goat smell totally do it so when the people left the campus the dean or president of the college whatever he said no oh, you know yeah if some people wanted to leave campus early they're not gonna be penalized well i think that was a mistake i think that they should have closed down college because it would have just been a few days because Thanksgiving break was beginning. If they would have just said, hey, you know what? Classes are canceled. They'll be online. Go home. Go be with your families. They have to attend funerals of four of their friends. These girls and this guy, Ethan, were friends to everybody. Ethan was a trip. How does somebody cut down four people in the, their lives that did nothing? Nothing. I, I mean, they're saying that this was a targeted attack. They're not saying which of the three girls or the guy was the target. They say that one of the girls had a stalker, but they don't have any corroborating evidence and they're asking for people to come forward with that. They set up a tip line and I'll put the tip line on my community page too. And on that tip line, they say that they've had, they have, they had a thousand tips and they've done 90 interviews. There was a food truck so the, the area of the sorority houses and whatnot, there was a bar. And I think that all of them were like in that area in the bar, whatever. Um, and then they went to a food truck. Truck had this um, live stream on and I think it was live streaming to Twitch so just kind of this thing, you know, watch people coming and going and grabbing food from this food truck. And it sounded good. People were just going there. And, and that's, you know, that you go to college and you get that freshman 15. I mean, they didn't have food trucks growing when I was growing up at college. But if they did, it would have been like the freshman freaking 30, 45. Because you go out drinking and then you're hungry and here's this food truck and you go. And so the 
food truck thing was this big red herring that people were saying, okay, there's this guy in the background with his hoodie and, oh, he's looking at them or whatever. So, okay, hoodie guy was a suspect based on, you know, everybody on the internet and they entered this, you know, interviewed this guy and he has nothing to do with it. Um, they ruled out the ex-boyfriend, I think of Kaylee, I think it was Kaylee Goncalves who had the ex-boyfriend that they called several times that night, um, ruled him out. And I think he has their dog. I think they had a dog that they shared and they showed that the dog is fine. Um, and there's a reason for that in just a second. But, um, I think they showed the two girls went home from the bar or whatever. The two girls went to the food truck and they got a ride home from a private party and at first it was said there was a, U, a Uber, but I think that the private party gave them a ride. They said they've talked to the private party now and ruled that out. So there had been something where earlier in the school year, there was something and it said that there had been an incident of vandalism and for people to um, be vigilant and report anything unusual that they've seen. And that was questioned right away. And they said, oh, you know, that's unrelated. Well, turns out that that was a skinned and filleted dog. So it was a dog. The fur was taken off and it was cut in the middle, filleted like a butterfly. And they say they're unrelated, okay? I don't think they're unrelated at all. I think they're completely related. I think others do too. Because the girls had a dog, like I said. And I think it was Kaylee's. So the boyfriend came and got the dog. It sounded like the dog lived in the house and everybody in the house loved the dog. Sounds like, you know, the dog wasn't just, okay, just Kaylee's dog. It was everybody's dog. And he's safe, thank God. <sighs> They said is that the same knife was used to kill all four and it was a fixed blade knife they say that the amount of um, violence projected conducted was so intense that there's no way that the killer didn't cut himself in the act and I say himself because You want to think it's a guy because you don't think that there's a female that could do this. If it was one person, sure. You, you could say across the board, especially when you look at Jodi Arias with the level of overkill that she did on Travis Alexander. So you can, you can say, was it a jealous female? I don't know. The former FBI agent who's now, uh, she is a professor for University of, of Missouri. I think she runs the forensic psychology program there. And she said that the level of intensity with this knife means something that this person was familiar with the knife and how this knife worked that speaks to me with the dog incident that this psychopath was testing his knife doing psycho ass things i think they need to see i mean what is the serial killer dyad you know the fires cruelty to animals and violence towards another person so i think they really need to see if there's been any fires in the area i think they need to um expand what they're asking for 
they asked for anybody who had surveillance footage in the area, you know, ring camera, um, anybody who had taken footage or whatever, from the, from the time of 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. is I think where they said, I'm going, no, oh, no, 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 no. You need to go way back because you don't know if this fuck was sitting there laying in wait. You don't know if this person didn't go into that house, sit there, sit there in a closet and wait until they thought everybody was asleep and then go do this heinous thing. Four people, two in two different rooms. At first, it was just saying that Xana fought back. And now it's saying that, you know, at least two of them fought back. So you have to say they were asleep. False reports came out that they were bound and gagged. Okay. The real easy thing that people would say is that they were drugged. So do you go back and look at who was at the party? And did they find a way to drug these four and nobody else? Did they drug all six? Were they at the bar watching and they roofied all six so the other two slept through it? Did they go in the room looking for one and got caught in the act and murder the other two who usually slept in the room with Xana is what I'm wondering. Cause if there's a total of six, where's the one roommate? Where did, where was she? And then the house has a, or door, there was a slider door in the back and the house had a code and people are like, well, who knew the code? And people are like, everybody knew the code. And that's, that's Greek life. I mean, it said that there was parties there, and there are parties everywhere. It's homes just get trashed. I mean, I remember this one house, and they had a keg, and they were doing these water slides with the keg. Like, they were just pouring the beer on the floor, and you just go back and run and just slide on that, and you're just going, how are they going to redo these floors of beer? I mean, just wild party life and that's that's what they were doing you know they were they were living that lifestyle i'm not saying that they went to that level because you know that was back in the 90s and hopefully people aren't that destructive with property anymore but it's very easy for people to be in and out and you just say for that amount of rage there had to be rejection had to be anger, rage, rejection. So you go, was it a guy who was at one of the parties and none of the girls were talking to him and he felt snubbed? Was it somebody who wasn't invited to the parties? Was it somebody who was kicked out of a party? Now, Idaho has this kind of ways. So you got this friendly, fun, you know, undercurrent of college students, whatever. But then you got your wackos, too. Because there's a place called Hayden Lake. It's not too far in there. And that is the home of the, um, let's see. I don't think there's a nice way to say it. The KKK, um, white supremacists. There are people who are anti-government. Um, and so was there somebody who was an extremist and a racist and former military and came back? with much hate and rage and just saw them looking like they had everything that they didn't. 
and they didn't pay attention to him? He followed them? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's where you would think it would be one. But it's got to be rejection. It's got to be rage. It's got to be something. Because then you're like, oh, maybe it was somebody who's all drugged out. No. These were accurate stab wounds. Four different people. And where did he go afterwards? Does that state that he lives alone? Because this person probably has many cuts on them. They say it was like a hunting knife, which, like I say, I think it's, you know, I think there's got to be a correlation with the, the dog. Um, because if it's, you know, something that would skin an animal, and it's, you know, this person hunts probably, is um, comfortable, familiar with a knife. So you say, you know, it's military, it's, I don't know. It's just tragic. I mean, these people are going into the holidays. They're having to have a funeral. I don't know. And it, it's, it's interesting because when I grew up in Spokane, we had, so we had Kevin Coe. And he was a rapist. And we had the Comstock Flasher, Comstock Park. And this man would like hide behind the trees and jump out and flash you. And so there was Kevin Coe. He, the, so the South Hill Rapist, was, it would turn out to be Kevin Coe, the Comstock Flasher, Ted, who was in the bigger areas, and then the Green River Killer. So that was all going on in my land. And, you know, my little second grade self thought that I had all the answers because I held my chapstick like it was mace when I was walking anywhere. No one was going to mess with me. Not one of them rapists or flashers. I didn't walk by the trees at all. Walked very far away from them, in fact. But what about... What is it about that area then that even back in the 80s was a haven for psychopaths? What is it about that land that fosters that? What are your theories? Have you guys looked into this? Have you heard of it? Press conference. They had. Oh, they had a. This poor reporter. She needs to go in the corner with a dunce cap on. Is it okay to say dunce or did I just offend a whole group of people? Honestly, I am so sick of all of these things that, you know, you can't say because it offends these people and whatnot. Is it going to soon be that you can't say asshole because people who are assholes are going to be offended? You know, honestly, so there was this press conference and they said that, you know, the, the governor has allowed another million dollars um, for this, that, um, you know, all these FBI agents, all of these resources, we've got to figure out who did this. And then they go into their thing, you know, how they've had the, the tips and the interviews. And, you know, it was day 10, day 11. And then you get this reporter and she stands up. Um, yeah. Well, can you, like, tell me if there is any truth to the fact that this was a murder-suicide? <laughs> and you just go, oh. Oh, and, you know, at first be like, oh. And then, like, oh. Oh, no. Because would you really think that it wouldn't have went, like, past, like, the next hour? I mean, wouldn't you have thought that then there'd be a news conference and it said that there was this terrible tragedy, this murder-suicide, would you really think that it would have went on for all this? And when you think that the wounds on the person who committed suicide would be much different than um, the rage that were inflicted upon the other three, and the other person would have had, you know, some things, but you could tell that they were defense wounds and maybe slashed their wrist or, you know, whatever. 
still. So I was like, what? How? Where? Where is there a thread that says it? Come on. There no, then you could not have, have fooled, you know, 20 to 24 FBI agents and all this murder suicide. No, 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 no. And then I, so I figured it out because I was trying to figure out, you know, if it was anywhere. And if you Google college murders, there was indeed murder, a murder suicide. I think it was in Oregon, um, not too long ago. So I think that there's some confusion with people who aren't familiar with the Pacific Northwest. And they saw that. And that's how that came up. But like I say, with the totality of everything there to bring that up, it's just like, no, 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 no. I mean, if, and, you know, if there was a GUN involved, you would have, you, you would not even question this because, you know, if they had a silence or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. But still, you would know if it was a murder suicide. I was just like, wow, I don't think that that chick's going to have a job. And so, you know, the the word um, I-N-C-E-L comes up a lot. And I didn't even know what that term was until a couple of years ago. And my kids, you know, described, you know, where it's, it's a uh, cohort of young males who have been rejected and are resigned to being rejected. Um, stay on the computer a lot. Um, only relate to the computer know that they're not going to be able to get a woman, so they become very misogynistic and, and hate women. And so, you know, that comes up right away. You're like, okay, it must be one of those. And so I guess when that term was being floated around, you can't say that. That's that's an offensive word now. Like I say, I mean, what is it going to be? Call somebody an asshole and be like, oh, I'm offended because my dad and my grandma were all assholes. God. So, I don't know what to think. I don't have any gut feelings other than what I've just kind of said. And I, I mean, and then you go, okay, are, are those just the simple, simple theories? Is that just a template to it? You know, is, is that what everybody thinks? And it's going to be something just totally bananas? I don't know. With that being said, let's enter Watts World. You ready? Oh, hold on. Hold on. One more thing. Hey. Well, the poor little baby Quentin. And his horrible, horrible mother. You know, I specialize in skanks that shouldn't have bred. And this one is in particular. Oh, my God. Okay. So that story, you got grandma, it's her name BJ, right? She's a, allegedly a former prostitute and drug addict. And she had two children, a boy and a girl. And the boy already, she said she lost him. I think he died from a drug addict. A drug overdose or is he in prison for what I cannot remember right now I'm telling you his COVID brain is just done so anyway Leilani has had two beautiful children CPS stepped in and did the right thing for once and took away her parental rights for these two children. There was the boy and the girl. And I'm saying the third, because I thought there was rumors of her being pregnant. And I don't, I don't know if she is or not. I don't know if that was a rumor or whatever. Okay. So she's got this cute little boy named Quentin. Little girl. Grandma, BJ, steps in. And gets full parental rights of those children. Her daughter gets the rights severed. She gets custody of them. 
she lets them all live under her roof. I don't think that Leilani lived with her the whole time, but she did during this time frame, whatever, right? So the story goes that this mom, BJ, she worked and whatnot, and she was paying the babysitter down the street what, $30 a day to watch both kids from 5.36 in the morning until 6 at night? Some odd thing, you know, for like 30 bucks a day. Um, I do believe that that was state-paid daycare. So the way that it's looking is that Grandma had custody of the kids. Well, Grandma was gone, worked, whatever. She paid the lady down the street, the babysitter, to watch them. Leilani was living back at home. And actively doing drugs. Now, BJ stated that she was letting her daughter care for her kids because when she herself was a young prostitute drug addict, she had gotten her parental rights severed of Leilani and her brother. And she didn't want her daughter to feel the pain from that. So, she got custody of them and was letting her daughter see them, but ultimately it was her responsibility to pay for this, whatever. So, outsider looking in goes, oh, okay, so you pulled a little freaking scam, and you've got um, the money coming in from child support, uh, governmental assistance, food assistance, and babysitting assistance, and everything else, and you played a little game with the government, and CPS did not do their due diligence and make sure that uh, this wasn't happening because this was happening. And, and many neighbors came forward and said that um, the kids were often playing in the streets, um, that it was just an accident waiting to happen. And they were, they were disgusted at the way that there was not proper parenting going on and that there was drug usage, that there was, um, scary people and whatnot coming in and out of that house that looks like the Amityville Horror House. So I look at it, I'm like, Amityville Horror House? Mm -hmm. Pretty much fits. So I guess Grandma has a little pool in the background, backyard, so probably like one of those above ground things. And I guess that Quentin was in the... In the in her. Saw him going in the pool by himself and went and got him. I mean, what is he, two years old? 19 months old, two years old. Got him out of the pool a few months ago and, you know, told the mom that, oh, my God. And then, you know, they were found in the street, playing in the street, and went on the babysitter, would take him back, whatever. So as this story goes, somehow the babysitter was paid to watch Quentin and his sister because Grandma BJ was going to be out of town for the night or whatever. <sighs> oh, Grandma leaves thinking that the babysitter is caring for the kids. Somehow something happens and the babysitter said she had to be at church early in the morning or whatever, so she brought the kids home, whatever, Leilani was allegedly using drugs. Something terrible happened. We don't know what happened at this point. But when she did not bring Quentin to the babysitter later that morning or next morning, the babysitter alerted the mom, grandma, and... Grandma asked Leilani, and somehow it came out that she said something like she threw him away in the garbage. The boy. So, I, I don't know how that piece fits in there. But she threw her kid away. So, as you all know, there's been this massive, massive undertaking with all of these FBI agents and city officials going through the landfill, they took like a whole weekend to, where they said that they, oh, they were, the authorities took the weekend off. They did not take the weekend off. They made this huge grid because they knew that all of this 
garbage has been collected from here and that in this certain amount of time, they had to go back and figure out which trucks dumped where in relation to her neighborhood during that date, etc., etc. While the FBI is setting up this massive grid to do this massive undertaking, Leilani and her mother and a friend were pictured at like a local, I think it was Applebee's or whatever, doing shots. And you've got the internet saying, oh my gosh, look at the FBI agent. They're taking the weekend off. Investigators are taking the weekend off. And they kind of let the slide that, oh, the mom who threw her kid away into the garbage and the grandma and everything are over there getting shots, taking shots. Huh. Right? Mm. So anyway, the babysitter loved this child, bathed this child. This, she said that this kid would come over all sticky, his hair all matted, everything. She loved this child like he was hers, by all accounts. They found him. And there's some moving pieces around how Grandma BJ brought her daughter to the police station or whatever to turn herself in, whatever. You have a division of the internet blaming the babysitter, blaming the grandma. And the other third correctly placing the blame on the mother. So we're living in this world where we say, how did Casey Anthony get away with that? Man, that evidence was clear. This is how. When you have two-thirds of the people pointing the finger, other than the one-third where it should be, that's how we had a Casey Anthony. Okay? Now, both O.J. Simpson... And Casey Anthony are people that changed our judicial system in ways that we still cannot grasp. I don't know. I don't know if OJ is innocent. Or guilty. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if we'll ever know. I know that, you know, it says, oh, yeah, he confessed in that book. He said, if I did it. And I read the book. And I've watched the documentaries. And there was so much that we didn't know. Because trials are watered down. So that they don't offend the jury pool. Which is disgusting. That they don't know the whole thing. That it's estimated that 40% to half of the evidence ever gets put in front of the jury because the other is too much and it might cause an excited reaction. Not, not excited in the way that you think, like, good, but excited, upset, um, overwhelming feelings. So they water everything down for us. So the facts and the truth are somewhere in the details because people have made decisions on what will be known. And what does that do to the victim? The victim endured those gruesome acts that may be too much for others to to see, wouldn't want to upset them or have them have an excited outburst or a overwhelming emotional response. Same went on with the trial of Casey Anthony and her beautiful daughter, Kaylee Marie. 
So as you watch Leilani go to trial, I want you to think about what you're seeing in the narrative and why the narrative is that way. Right now, we have a lot of people with a lot of agendas. Everybody's trying to get that one interview that's going to get them on TV and make their YouTube channel the one that everybody goes to. And they're stomping on the necks of victims as they do so. And it's really, really sad. And I just shake my head. It's not the babysitter's fault. It's the mother's fault. When she made the decision to become a mother and not stop what she was doing. And I know that there's people out there, but there, but she's an addict and addict, addiction is a disease. And I know. And the sister that went to Cabo with me is not here because she did not get sober. And she, in fact, passed away from her own addiction at the age of 29. So I understand that addiction is a disease. That disease is in my DNA. And I think that this world is much more difficult to go through sober than it ever would be to be on drugs. To fight what your, your genetics and your, your, um, your nature and your nurture are there when you can have your sibling that went in the other direction that you did. You say, why? So I understand addiction and I understand the family dynamics and I understand that. But when she had her parental rights taken away and she still was given the privilege of seeing her children and she couldn't be a parent, she couldn't be a parent for the one hour, whatever. It was more important for her to be high and then she throws her whole entire kid away. It's disgusting. And the only blame should be on her. So please don't get pulled into the narrative. Put the blame where it belongs. So many people do say that the grandmother should be arrested as well. And, and that's, that's a discussion point that should be evaluated. And I don't know if there's going to be charges. But again, we're at the point where, what is CPS doing? If CPS is so overwhelmed and underpaid and whatnot, why aren't they getting up there on their podium and saying, we need this many more caseworkers, we get this many calls, and we can't do our jobs because they hide behind this, you know, that this is confidential and they can't do that. And this is ridiculous. Too many babies have lost their lives. And we don't have the resources for children who are abused. And we don't have proper and safe places for abused children to go. There needs to be a whole reform of the, of the whole system. And they dropped the ball for Quentin. And last but not least, in my series of skanks that should not have bred, we are once again headed to Watts Island. Oh, the players, the players, the players. Oh, Anno Teeth came back on the scene this week. And A, the one that's hailed as the hero, right? The one that, if it wasn't for her, we would have never known what happened, right? And if it wasn't for NK, they'd all be alive, right? I have heard me all in the same seven day period. this channel, this new podcast come up and it says it's like for all females or whatever and it has this newscaster looking guy and he straight up says if NK would not have came along there's a very good chance that those three would be alive that's not true it's not true at all how can you be so silly right 
and you go, okay, do you know the facts and the truth that they were separated, that the house was going to be taken over by the sheriff on any day because she had not been making the house payments and that they were indeed separated. Okay, so anyway, anyway, okay? Hold, please. Hold, please, with my... I get my Watts Tourette's going. In. So, apparently, there was like this Facebook group, a couple of them, and they had a troll that the groups that are on there are some that have a good conversation going where it's working towards the truth and by the accounts that i've gotten you know people say hey this is a great group that you know has has great conversations and um they're not all about the narrative they're more about the truth well i guess they had had this one member who'd just been silent for you know years in this group well she'd been screenshotting and screenshotting and screenshotting and giving it to na which gives it to the ruse oh apparently <laughs> na's little girl is on the living room floor or whatever and she's sticking out her tongue like a little brat, right? And somebody said, oh my God, it's a little mini SW. <laughs> she should grow up to be just like her because you know, the any influence, whatever, right? So that was given to any. And then there was a picture of any not having her child seat belted, right? Or whatever, right? So the troll who was just sitting there taking screenshots was taking screenshots with everybody's name on it who was commenting and whatnot so na comes out with this statement and says that she will never privatize her facebook because she wants to get a lot of money off of her mlm and sell a lot of stuff when people look up her friend that she's still exploiting to this day i mean no she she says she won't put her facebook on private because She's an exploitative twat. Um, she wants to, she will never put her Facebook to private because people will find it anyway. Hmm. And so she's been getting these screenshots mailed to her. Now she has an entire list of cyber bullies. And she used these examples and cited that that's cyber bullying. So saying that this little girl being a, bla a brat is a little SW in NA's mind is cyberbullying. And she has a list of all of the people, you know, who are saying things in this group. And she wants all of her little minions who she has following the narrative to go to Facebook and report all of these people's profiles for cyberbullying. Cyber bullying. That's what she thinks is cyberbullying. We have teenagers losing their lives every day due to actual cyberbullying. We have creepy, creepy pedos lurking on Facebook that are grooming young girls. We have hate groups actual cyber bullies that have caused people to take their own lives. And this fat bitch wants to call that cyber bullying and go to the ruse with her information and then they sit there. Is this how they're dealing with their grief? Because they have a Thanksgiving without their family and rather than work through the grief through healthy steps this is what they want to do well it's all they know and it's all they've ever done they have continued to not 
address the elephant in the room. Since how many generations back? We know that Mama Rue's mama was not present per Mama Rue's discussions, okay? So that was just comical. Now, remember, N.A. is not the hero. N.A. did not not hear from S.W. for 10 minutes and sound all the alarms. That's not true. We know that for a fact. That's still in the narrative that is being purported. N.A. did not like S.W. N.A. worked with S.W.'s mother at the Supercuts. When the mom moved over to Colorado, worked at Supercuts, the mom did not want to turn her back on S.W. and the way that she was watching the kids or not watching them and had her watch S.W. for her and report back to her. That was not a friend. That was a hired caretaker? I don't even know. Now, does N.A. get along with the ruse? Yes. And she always did. She was she was her mother's friend. She was not S.W.'s friend. Okay? The home on Saratoga Trail has sold. A family with three children, I believe. And they said that they walked into the home and they felt the warmth of her and the girls and felt that because of the way that she had cared for the home, they felt that they could take over where she left off and raise their children there and continue with happy memories. And I wish them the best with that. Good luck with that. Because that was not a happy home. At all. But that's a good and healthy way to look at that. And I wish them the best. I don't know how much the house sold for. And I don't know how far back she had not been making the mortgage and HOA payments. And with her putting the home into foreclosure and the house sitting there vacant for so long, I don't know if any profit was there, but because the ruse have the judgment against CW, if there is any money that was made from that, it goes straight to the ruse, of course, because that's all that has ever mattered. Money and image. Not the truth and not the facts. And it's sad. Very sad. I rank sometimes and I don't see it. I don't see... I don't see the meanness in his eyes. I, I look at him and I think that he... I think he could have been kind. I think she's the master of puppets, Mama Roo. She's been doing some dirty deeds and her daughter turned out just like her, even though her daughter rebelled. And so on Watts Island, we have a new member. And... I don't know... If he is a practicing therapist or what his psychological degree is, but I heard some chatter and I was like, okay, cool, cool. We need a mental professional on here because every other mental professional has gotten it wrong because they went with the original narrative that we all did in the beginning. Dr. Phil got it wrong. Dr. Grande got it wrong. So I was like, all right, this guy's coming on to here and it looks like he's going to be able to play ball. And I guess he was doing some really good um, illustrations and everything. So I thought, all right. And so I listened to his um, psychoanalysis of SW. And I think I had a coronary attack. A what's, a what's a coronary? A coronary Watts attack. And 
a big, a big Tourette's attack. And then I just had to go sit in the bubble bath for a little while. I started to write him a comment. And then I was like, no, 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 no. He's exactly where I was when I came onto the scene after doing my basic surface day, I scratched the surface that I felt that some things were not true. And that's when I started listening to a certain channel, as y'all know. And with about the same amount of knowledge that this guy had, I went on a panel on this channel, a panel on the channel. And I said some of the things word for word that he did. And y'all remember, I was baptized by fire and ultimately exiled from that channel. And the fact that they don't even know who I am anymore or ever did. I don't exist. I do not exist. And I felt that I had done something wrong, as y'all know, because I was like, oh my gosh, this person is a highly esteemed attorney and an attorney would not be purporting misinformation because that is a grounds to be removed from the bar but when you're not even a member of the bar I guess it doesn't matter now does it but anyway I learned and what a learning curve I have been through I started my channel because I got exiled from that community because I thought in the same way that this, this man does. And I repeated some of the things that I had heard on that channel. And I realized that I had been remiss in repeating some things that were not true. And I have set forth to go and find answers myself. And I have shared with you when I have made mistakes and went and, you know, really found out where I was wrong and um, balanced the shiner side and the hater side and came up in the middle understanding both sides. And then really looking at Neek's Peaks because Neek's Peaks brings the receipts. Has a lot of the original videotapes and Facebook posts. So we can see with our own eyes and hear with our own ears what exactly was going on in that home. In the beginning, there was a couple of videos and whatever and look like this beautiful woman with these two darling little girls and just wonderful in the prime of their lives and he was a dirty dog and went and had his salty dog licked off and this hussy came along and because he liked the the hussy pussy better then he took out his family and gosh you make one sandwich wrong and you're one step away from that fate with you and your kids too because if it could happen to that beautiful family that was well off in this beautiful neighborhood and driving a Lexus and traveling all over and miss popularity right there oh goodness sakes what hope is there for any of us I mean honestly well nothing could be further from the truth and as I go and I find out all of the answers myself and, and as I've shared with you, um, I had bouts of insomnia and I couldn't, um, listen to the videos. So I was watching all of these videos and then I got the sleep headband and then I could actually listen and, and then get the sound with things and, and then get closer to the truth and then I've done my own extensive research and I'm continuing to do so but I didn't know how to make a video I didn't know how to make a recording and look at this now I've got a swing and everything on this channel and have 
got this new microphone for myself. Do you, do you guys like the way I sound in it? Yeah? But, I, I mean, I, I've just been through such a learning adventure in, in this six months. And thank you all for being there with me. So, I am not a therapist, as you all know. I am very close to my master's in forensic psychology. That does not make me a practicing therapist um, or anything like that. So, I cannot diagnose, treat, anything of the like. And so I don't know what she suffered from. I think that if everything was teased out, he's probably right with his diagnosis of histrionic personality disorder. But he does not have all of the facts, correct? And what we could say with that is that if a provider goes and interviews a client, he only knows what they say and the basic things anyway. So what does, what does any therapist actually know? A lot of clients don't have insight. And there's certainly very few people that are going to come in and be like, you know what, I'm a fucking turd. And I need to fix my turdly ways. And I do this and I do that and I suck. And I did this and I did that. No, 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 no. No, that's not a comforting feeling. It's a comforting feeling to go into a therapist and tell them how everybody's so screwed up around you. And that you are this wonderful person in the middle of it. You know, what the hell is wrong with anybody around you? And they have to do their best in the time allotted figure out in that 50 minute session once a week to uh, once every two weeks to figure out with what you're saying and the way you're presenting yourself if you're bringing everything to the table or not so you can look at what he said with that and say okay okay because that's that's a very good guess but what he doesn't know is what we have found out and we've found out by comparing all of these things from all of these documents and all of these different creators and sifting and, and twisting and moving things around and shaking it out again and coming forth with the truth and the facts that are getting pretty hard to be indisputable. Now, there's a reason why Christopher Watts did not go to trial. DA didn't want him to. You think that it's questionable as to how Casey Anthony got off? How O.J. Simpson got off? It is because we have a judicial system that makes you not determine somebody's guilt or innocence. But if you believe as the jury that this person is guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. And if we have thousands of thousands and thousands of people still talking actively, and people writing books and people doing podcasts, Four, out, four years later, you cannot say beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christopher Watts is responsible for the loss of life of three individuals and an unborn baby. Four total, right? You can't say it. And the DA knew it. The DA knew that they could not prove the case. So they did their dirty deal and it'll be undone. I don't know when, but as I have provided the truth that the 35C can be used anytime he wants to. Right now, he doesn't see anything different about his, his living situation than the way that he had it. Now, when this creator was talking about how he came to his evaluation, and I think the guy has a lot of potential. It seems like a very nice guy. So um, I did just tell him, you know, in a comment, I said, hey, you know, I was right where you were when I started and, and you're wrong about a few things. And I um, suggested Neek's Peaks um, for him to look at. Now, I like it when somebody says I'm wrong 
in my comments. That's the fastest way to piss me off and be like, you're wrong here. And so my wording might come off rude to him as you're wrong, but fundamentally he is. Um, he said the reasons why he, he, he came to the diagnosis of histrionic personality are because, number one, she had a lot of friends, that she was an extrovert to the effect that when people had not heard from her for 10 minutes on social media, the alerts were sounded. Okay. We know that that isn't true. That her friends were as disposable as her tampons because, or the condoms that she went through, the boxes of condoms because she was infertile, right? So you wear condoms when you're a married person. But anyway, friends. These were people that she had something to cultivate from. There was nobody in her life that she gave to. The people in her life were temporary and transient. And they gave to her and she took from them. These interviews of people that come forward, most of them were in her MLM. And there's reasons for that. And it wasn't because she was instilling how to become a good salesman, saleswoman. And that's another thing. He said that she was a, a, you know, a masterful saleswoman and that she took a very little amount of money and made so much that she was very successful financially. That is, that is not true. Um, the friends, there are people that came and went in her life. Where are they? Where are the friends that lived in her home and saw what she was doing? And we know that there were problems in what she was doing. Now, if this woman would not have went forward and had children, I would not be talking about her this Thanksgiving Eve night. If she would not have abused her children and created a toxic, abusive environment in her home, I would not have given this situation a second thought. But because she did, and those are now things that are proven, I do speak in the attempt of helping others identify abusive behavior in the situations around them. That even though something looks picture perfect, it isn't. And however you need to develop those negatives and turn them into the truth, you've got to do it. Because there's got to be a voice for the voiceless. Now, where are her friends from high school? If she was so popular and such an extrovert, where are these people that knew her in school where are they in these interviews okay her neighbors had very um weighted words and when they talked about her routines and whatnot um that she they say that you know she was uh very set in her routines okay that's not that's not a friend um na as i've as i've said was not her friend na was her mother's friend and she did not get along with with her, with, with SW. She was reporting back to her mother and SW knew she was reporting back to her mother and she was helping her conceal her lies to CW. SW found that if her mother sicked this bitch on her, like went on rice, then she was going to use it as well. But okay, NA, you want to keep it clean because you're going to get the mail when I'm not there because obviously Mama Rue was getting the mail when SW wasn't home because they made sure that Christopher Watts did not know that while he was getting up at the crack of dawn and coming home in the evening after he had gotten his girls up in the morning 
drove them to daycare. And that's where we get into something a little different. Went to work. Went to the gym. Picked up the girls from daycare. Had dinner. Was instructed to bathe the girls and give them rectal temperatures every single night. While she stood behind him filming. And be complicit, complicit in locking those girls up without food, water, or bathroom privileges from 6.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. He was complicit in that at her order. That's not a woman who is liked by many. That is not a good mother. That is not an amazing mother. Because the girls were in daycare towards the end of their young lives, they may have had some joy in their life. Prior to that, then she was home with them and locked them in those bedrooms with locks, with keys, with sound machines so that they could not hear her out there for 15 hours out of a 24-hour day. That is not an amazing woman who has done all of these things. As I read the whole bankruptcy the other night in full, all 40 pages, you guys heard where the money went. And it was not that they needed to claim bankruptcy because of her health issues. No, you heard that was about $2,500. The rest was her frivolous, out-of-control spending. And Christopher and her knew exactly how the money was and whatnot. There was no money left over. There was $11.37 left over or whatever per month. She did not take that little $11 and go and invest that and make a lot of money. She decided, you know what, I'm not going to make the house payment nor the HOA payment. I am going to go ahead and take that money that my husband works sun up to sundown to make and not tell him that the money that he is making is not being made into something for our family, that it is being made into something for me so that I will use his money and I will use and exploit him and I will use and exploit every single human being that I can get in this path so that I can buy my rank and I can buy these vacations. And some of them she took CW on, but the other she certainly didn't. And she was with another man who resembles her youngest child very much. And the dates have fallen in very, very perfectly as to why she was lying about her due date. And you guys can refer to the other videos that I've shown. That puts it very likely that she bought the vacation in New Orleans with her husband's money. By not making the mortgage payments to go and conceive a child. Which is why she was in North Carolina for the six weeks prior to her demise that August. Her mother helped and enabled the lies. I want to know how many of you out there would do that to your husband, would do that to your children, would do that to your legacy. So when she was not at home, she was making N.A. get her mail so that Christopher would not know that the home was in foreclosure, that at any day, any moment, the sheriff was going to come and evict them from that home. She had her backup plan. She was separated. She went to North Carolina with her mother, had her parents there so that she could go and tell CM that, you know what, hey. But he rejected her. And she went back to go and sell the house. But at some point, he was going to figure out that the house payment had not been made. In how many months? Some say 10 months. Some say a year. Could be longer. HOA was not being made. She had $25,000 of stock in the basement. She used the money that was supposed to go for the mortgage that he worked every day for. And used it to go and buy herself vacations. Is that a good mother? No. She put every single one of those women around her in positions where they had to sit there and listen to her complain and lie about her husband and complain and lie about her illnesses that did not exist. 
and complain and lie about her children and how her children were so hard on her because they were monsters. And although she locked them out, up for 15 out of 24 hours a day, she was overwhelmed. That is not a good mother. That is not somebody who takes a little bit of a, a money and makes it into something wonderful. Because he said that she was, you know, she was smart and, and did this with this. That is the illusion. That is the narrative. And that is not true. Without those major, major aspects of her, her personality, her behavior, you cannot properly diagnose. It wasn't the first time that she was um, using money for her own gain. Please refer to the Queen of the Dirty South in my previous videos for more information on that. But what we have here is we have somebody who was accused of embezzlement that bought a beautiful house. And when that uh, heat was getting too uh, close, she found a new man and got a divorce, got a new man, got the fuck out of the state. That's not a woman who has a lot of friends who's this extrovert and wonderful. No. That is somebody who is exploiting every single person around them again. Now, when she was 17 or 18, she had the fight with her mother where her mother allegedly slapped her. She left home and did not speak with her mother. But her mother came in handy when she needed her to cover for her dirty deeds. Okay? That, these are all parts of a person who once they're being, when, when somebody has passed away, then you're doing like a forensic psycho analysis of them, right? Because forensic is to look back at how something happened. And as we looked at the bankruptcy papers, we could go back and say, okay, these dollars went here and whatnot. But that was up to the point where she claimed bankruptcy. I don't have access yet to where their financials were at that point. Um, a forensic accountant would be really good at looking at the, you know, the, the checking accounts and all of this and, and getting it together. And so you can say that a forensic psychologist, even though I'm close to my master's in forensic psychology, I am not a forensic psychologist. I can look at things and see how they went backwards. And as he was saying, he was doing a psychoanalysis on her and she, you know, she's not here to tell you this. He has to know the entire story and it may tease out that it comes to the same conclusion that she had histrionic personality disorder very likely but i think that there are so many more comorbidities and until everything is there i don't think that it's an accurate diagnosis i could be wrong not likely but you know so that's where I did say the word that he's, he was wrong. And like I say, I hope he doesn't take it offensively. It's just, I was there and I had to find out the hard way that what I thought was true wasn't. And it's very disturbing to me to, um, to know how those, how those girls were neglected and maltreated and downright abused. Um, I hope that he looks at some of the behavior, you know, with the pinching and the, the weird tickling and the forcing them to say things and um, using them as objects and puppets and the emasculation of Christopher Watts and the lying and the, and the deceit and the, the absolute fever pitch that she put in that house, that it was a toxic environment. It was a hostile environment. It was not a fun and happy environment in that home. I hope that he sees that they were indeed separated and, you know, look at that uh, news um, clip where when the news in North Carolina went to Mama Roo's workplace and Mama Roo's co-worker was talking about how Shanann was there with the two girls and she was pregnant because she was separating from her husband. It was common knowledge. She didn't have any intentions of going back to Colorado until it became very clear that she wasn't going to be able to stay there. She had to go to plan B and that's why she had to write on her hand 
I forgive you to Christopher because she'd been fucking around on him and lying to him and not making the house payment. When and how was she going to tell him that she had not been making the house payment? When it was very clear that she knew exactly how much the house payment was in the HOA because we saw that she testified that she had went to debt counseling along with him in the bankruptcy filed in 2015, three years before whatever happened. So we go, okay, well, who else did this? Well, we don't know. People think that NK could have came in there. They think all these other things could have came in there. But even if he went with the affirmative and, and he said that, you know what, I am guilty. I did this. A good attorney could get in there and say he was guilty by reason of mental defect, mental insanity, that maybe she did say, I haven't made the house payment in 14 months. You fuck. Now what are you going to do? He's like, what? I've worked every day and you've done what? And maybe he lost his shit. I don't know. Which would explain her. But I don't understand what happened to the girls. I will never understand. I could see him getting so rage filled. And, and not that it's her fault. I mean, she, she had something wrong with her head. There was a screw loose. Okay. Or maybe two. It is not her fault that somebody took her life. However, there are things you just don't do. Like I say, you don't go to Cabo and go and take a freaking walk by yourself off the resort area and go and make friends. Uh, 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 don't do it. They, you know, there's all these stories too, you know, of, of like the, you know, the police down there in Mexico and you get pulled over and you have to give them a bunch of cash. If you don't have the cash. Okay. There are just some things you don't do. So then I saw this other video that came up. And SW was going, well, you know, CC was, you know, was throwing all these fits. And, and you know, and, and it's not the CC I know. And she's throwing these fits for 45 minutes at a time. And so I took her to the doctor to make sure that I, and, that I was being a good mommy. Um, so you're st sitting there whining. And I think it was in there, but I think it started that she said that she had to sell this crap to put these stickers on so that she could deal with her kids. So, and then she had to lock them up because, and pretend that she had read it in a book, that this is how you parent. So, so then she's taking Cece to the doctor because Cece's throwing these bits for 45 minutes and she wants the doctor to tell her that she'd be in a good mommy she there once again as a sacrificial lamb for all of her problems that oh if she didn't have these silly stickers to put on herself she couldn't deal with with cc you know cc's just this and i see people comments saying that she was insufferable and that she was a terrible child and you know she was a high energy child that wasn't properly fed watered and had a noise machine at the highest volume possible put next to her in her crib from the day she was born. And you see this, this child putting blankets and pillows over their head, trying to, to hear the silence. So she was not taught to hear the cues of, of people and, and, and normal noise in a home and whatnot behind closed doors a baby behind closed doors for 12 hours at a time and then three hours at a time. Not properly toileted, not taught autonomy, always trying to go for the sink and trying to drink out of the sink, eating her own feces, you know, the CC's feces videos and, and, and trapping herself in the toilet, trying to drink out of the toilet and drinking Dieter's water and eating Dieter's poop. And these are not normal things. Did she tell the doctor that she locks her up for 15 hours a day and restricts her water, puts her on a water restriction and restricts her food because of all of these fake allergies 
that she has. Yes, we've seen some of the, you know, the welts and whatnot. So indeed, she does have some allergies. But it's it's very suspect that some of the things she said she had allergies to, she was feeding her. So did she go to the doctor and be like, yeah, I lock her up for um, 15 out of 24 hours a day. And I have a water restriction on her. And, um, you know, she goes around wanting her bottle all the time and I don't have time for it because I needed to do videos that show my products and because I put them in there, I'm a better mom. And so because I lock them up for 15 out of 24 hours a day, I'm a better mom and it makes me a better mom. And, um, I'm saying that it was in a book and does this make me a good mom? And then I make my husband put a thermometer in both girls anuses every night and cover them in lube and I stand behind videotaping it and I make sure that um that we you know when we're when we're doing that to Cece we make sure that Bella doesn't come in we block her by the door and we do each girl one at a time did you tell him that because I don't think the doctor told you to do that did you tell the doctor that you are medicating Cece and Bella like little birds to come up giving them lots of Tylenol and lots of Benadryl and whatever else they're prescribed because of the colds and whatnot that they were getting because they were not cared for and with their asthma and whatnot, that their needs aren't met, that they're not being taught to trust, that they're not being taught autonomy, that they're not being taught the safety of their body and the no-nos and the and how to act. Did you talk to that? No? Did you just go in and say she's she's doing all this stuff and it's so hard on me? Can you tell me that I'm being a good mommy? Yeah, ignore the bald spots on both of the girls' heads. Because, you know, for those extended amount of times that they're in the crib, they must be pulling their own hair out. And, and oh, it's because they're malnutrition and everything. No. No. Uh-uh. Did you, did, you, did you make sure the doctor saw that? Uh-huh. Did you tell the doctor that you have all those books in there, but it's because you're selling these books, and so those books aren't to be read to the children? And did you tell them that you found Bella in the dark trying to read, and she had to hide the book underneath the bed because she knew you'd take it because the books aren't for reading and to be read to, therefore being in a shelf? Because you want the house to look immaculate, and you don't want them messing anything up. And so you won't even let Bella jump and run and have fun because you are placing Bella's role to be your sick child and you've made Cece be your out of control child that's so difficult on you that you can't get two minutes to yourself that you lock them behind doors what if there was a fire did you tell the doctor that or did you just go in and, and say that you couldn't figure this out and, and say, I, I just don't know if I'm being a good mommy. Am I doing anything wrong? Because she's just so out of control and she's a monster. Because you called them monsters and you called them thieves. And which doctor was that? Because you kept firing the doctors. And taking them to chiropractors. And Did you tell the doctor that? Or did you leave those things out? Because those are the kinds of things that you would leave out when you're going to the doctor, to the pediatrician, if you were a person such as herself. And those are the things that you would leave out if you were going to see a therapist, such as this nice man who's came onto the scene of Watts Island. You wouldn't tell him all of these things, and you wouldn't tell him that uh, you've been having these kind of uh, issues since you were a child. And they were called headaches, and you'd have these issues, and your parents would call them headaches and take you to every doctor that they could find, and, and you'd miss big periods of school and whatnot because of these headaches. Something wrong with their head. A headache. Their headaches. It's not, a, it's not anything else. And that she was so popular that she couldn't get a date for senior prom, so she took her brother. Is that an extrovert? That she didn't have any friends in high school. In fact, she became so close with her male teacher and confided in the male teacher that she wasn't loved at home. 
that nobody cared about her at home. But her father was an alcoholic, and her mother didn't notice her, and they both preferred her brother over her, and that he was the only male figure that she could trust or feel herself with. Yeah. Extrovert, loved, wonderful. All these friends, right? No. No. Christina Meacham, who came from Hawaii to take care of the kids when she had the elective surgery on her neck. She took, 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 and took from Christina. And Christina is the nicest person on the planet and doesn't say anything wrong with it because she is a person who loves to give. That's a friend, but that wasn't a two-way friendship. She'd call Christina and complain about Christopher, 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 and complain about all these things he was doing and whatnot. But you know what? She didn't mention that she was lying to him every day, looking him in the eye and lying and, and telling him that it was his fault and his fault and his fault when she wasn't making the house payment that he was going to work every day to pay. That when they worked out this budget, so they would not get in the same problem that they did, they were back in the situation they were because of her, because of all of the lies. But no, those aren't the things that you bring to the doctor. The doctor sees this picture and it looks picture perfect. You've got this beautiful mother bringing this child in this mother's telling this child's just out of control. You leave everything out as to why this child might be out of control. Well, do you read to your child? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of books. Um, does your child play outside? Ah, yeah, because yeah, we've seen the pictures of Christopher Watts trying to um, mow the lawn, and he had to have CC attached to his back with a carrier. And we've seen Christopher try and cook and do dishes, and he had to have her strapped onto him. Saw the little girls with crayons and Play-Doh and paint and dr playing dress-up and everything. No, you saw when they got in her makeup and she was upset and called them thieves and whatnot because she couldn't get their bottle, she couldn't get this. You saw when she was being very awkward trying to show that she could cook, and she looked like she'd never touched a bowl or a spatula or anything before. And she made Christopher his lunches because, as we figured out in that budget, there wasn't any money to feed anybody in that house. So she made him his egg salad sandwiches. But she found out how to... the eggs in the rice cooker. And then they ate... The Rive stuff, the MLM stuff. And she had him convinced that that was profit and, and that she had the stuff downstairs to give out as samples and, and all of that. And that she had, she had gotten all of that for free and the vacations were free and the airline was free. And, and well, some of it was, it was because she paid for it with the money that was supposed to be going to the house and the HOA payments. And her mother got the mail. And N.A. got the mail. And she didn't let Christopher see the bank account. She had him so bamboozled that he did not even know how to look to see if she had gotten money out when she was missing. Because she had everything stacked up in the house of cards in the picture-perfect life. That one little breath of air would have knocked over flat. And it did. And what happened? Did the abuse and the lies that she was committing on the girls and to him drive him literally crazy? Maybe. How would anybody handle that kind of information? I 
I would never hurt my children. But if my spouse came to me with that kind of a um, revelation, I can't say what I would do. I mean, just the level of deceit. <sighs> I don't know how you would even talk to the other person in the home doing that kind of stuff. There's just... things you don't do. And there are risky lifestyles. And so somebody could come along and psychoanalyze and say, you know what, this, this whole picture doesn't make sense because in victimology, you look at the person's lifestyle and, you know, were they engaging in this? Were they engaging in that? Which gives them this, okay, you're living this high-risk lifestyle, which means this not. They would look at her and be like, very low risk. Not knowing that she had the history of alleged embezzlement. The history of mental illness causing great periods of distraction in her life, beginning around the age of 13. That when the first husband took her to marital counseling, she didn't like what they were saying, so she decided not to come home. That it is rumored that she may or may not have been a lady of the night. So you say out of control spending, pathological liar. No real true friendships. False friendships. Complicated relationships. Deceit. Lies. Child abuse. Child neglect. We heard what happened to Cece in that bathroom. We didn't see it. The noise she made afterwards... The noise that Cece did sounds like a dog that got kicked. That yelp. Feigning illness. The word Munchausen by proxy is thrown out there for a reason. If I had to guess, and I am not diagnosing, I would say that she's just about everything in the cluster B personality disorder family. And I don't know how therapists tease those out because she has the traits of all of them. Histrionic, borderline, narcissistic personality disorder. Which one is it? Or is it all of them? I do believe that there's the bipolar disorder. I really think that that's what started the whole thing going. And then you say she's, you know, been known to pop pills and the wino. So then you go, okay, is there also a substance abuse disorder going on? And then with the illnesses that are not there and the illnesses that come up in the stressful periods of time when she is being called out on her behavior and it bordering or being criminal in nature, then you say she has conversion disorder. And you say a person with all of those things and then her being, she did physically attack, she did physically abuse Christopher Watts. That's not a secret. She talked about it. He talked about it before they were married and she beat his ass all the way out to the porch and wouldn't let him come back in until he decided to settle down and change his ways. Or she physically assaulted him on one occasion that she's proud of. How do we know how many other times there were? And we know that she was doing weird things with the flicking, the pinching, the abusive haircuts to Bella and not letting Bella play and sit. I mean, she had to sit because she was telling her that her foot hurt. 
so they could watch Cece run and jump on the trampoline. And when Bella tried, no, she could not. And nobody was going to question that she just said no. We saw that. So if all of that was presented on the table, what would you say the diagnosis is? Does batshit crazy come in the DSM-5 or not? The triangulation that a narcissist does was what she was doing. She targeted Christopher Watts' mother. She targeted her father. She used her mother to target Christopher. And y'all know I'm not saying Christopher. I'm saying Christopher because she wanted him to change his name. Like she's named it just Shanann. So she wanted to be Shanann and Christopher. And you look at it and you go, when I brought, when I broke down the salaries and you saw how much money was lost, it was because he had the great job as a mechanic that he was happy at. But because she got a settlement for Carpal Tunnel, she wanted him to get a settlement for Carpal Tunnel. And she made him quit his job where he was making almost twice as much. Because she didn't want him being a mechanic anymore. So he took a job making half as much. Which doesn't make any sense. Because if he would have kept the job or gotten another job similar, then maybe her spending out of control could have been reined in a little bit. I mean, why did she force him to get a job making half? And why did she lie about going to school? And why did she lie about this and this and this? Why? She was not a homemaker. She was not working from home. She was lying from home. She was not a housewife. But she locked the girls up because it made her a better mother. And it, it gave her the time that she needed for herself, she said, for herself. And then herself so she could watch TV later. You do that, you hear your little girl screaming, behind, and they have locked doors. I have never locked my kids in a door, ever. I don't think they even have locks on our bedrooms to this day. I don't know that I have, I think I have one on my bedroom, but I don't know, I... I I don't ever even shut my bedroom door. I mean, what do my kids need me? Yes, they're basically adults, but my God. I don't know how somebody could do that. So then you say, how could she? Does she have a conscience? She a sociopath? But the sociopath is an older term, so is it a psychopath? Like I say, when you have all of this, how do you diagnose? And maybe, maybe the, maybe the Jordan, well, the Jordan man who's a new resident to Watts Island will, will look at all of this and, and, and come up with another diagnosis. But you can't unless you know everything and, it's a good lesson for all of us to look at who's around us and remember that people are different behind closed doors and what they look like on the surface isn't it. I mean, you know those scratch and sniff stickers from the 80s? Every picture was a scratch and sniff. And that those were that were deceitful liars. You scratch the surface and it smelled like shit because it's lies. Or if you if they were good people and you scratch the surface and smelled like strawberries, they were good people. Maybe that'd make life easier. I think so. So in my quest to find the truth and and um some of the 
things that we deal with. We are now at, what chapter are we at? God. We're at chapter 10 in our book, Controlling People, How to Understand, How to Recognize, Understand, and Deal with People Who Try to Control You by Patricia Evans. Okay? And we are at chapter 10. And this goes into more of how the backwards, let me get a pen here. We'll write it down so it's a little easier. I'm still building my Patreon. I've got most of the videos all backed up over there. And still trying to get to the bottom of, bottom of who struck my channel. So we're going to read chapter 10. And it is defining a stranger is a very bizarre thing to attempt. Okay, defining a stranger is a very bizarre thing to attempt. Well, what's well, your own kid, right? So we go here and we go person to person relationships are the foundation of the world. When these relationships are good ones, there is harmony. When these relationships are bad, there is turmoil. So how does a person who is disconnected from him or herself relate to people? What happens to his or her relationships and how people attempt to relate to others when they have become for the most part disconnected from themselves this is really relevant to what we're talking about because people who are disconnected go into therapy and they don't even know who they are because they've attempted to define themselves and what if they were defined by somebody else what if Bella and Cece would have grown up and Bella was told that she was sick all of her life and couldn't jump like Cece on the trampoline because she was told by her mom that she couldn't jump because she had difficulty even walking. And Why was that? Nobody knows. Those poor girls. And I saw a comment on Neeks and it said I don't understand what you guys have a problem with the, with her using play pins all moms have to use play pins so they can keep their kids in how else will a mother get anything done um that's not the point of the video ma'am and if you're defending this are you defending that she locked up the kids too or is that what you're doing do you lock your kids up too is that how you get your things done well that's cheating ma'am that's not very good the biggest weirdos come out of nowhere and um of course you know i love um listening to what's the obsession and everything you know i i, I love kelly um so, you know, I, I would hope that if Jordan is looking at things, you know, he listens to Watch the Obsession and watches Neek's Peaks and, you know, all the good stuff. And um, so, people who operate on one cylinder, so to speak, with a built backwards identity are inclined to approach others in a backwards way. They may actually define a stranger as a way of introducing themselves, possibly intending to establish an instant connection. Their approach is often to tell the other what he or she should do, has done, will do, and so forth. This is a very important discovery on our journey of exploration through the maze of senseless behavior woven into our world. In fact, I believe it to be one of the more senseless behaviors, well woven into the fabric of everyday communications. We'll spend a little time exploring this territory so that we can find everything we need to carry us through the rest of our journey. If we see someone on a daily basis, we may assume that we know them so well that we know what they're thinking or what they should do. If we voice such an assumption, defining them in one way or another, we are likely to find out we're wrong and that our assumption calls for an apology. Side note. What happens in an assumption? What if you assume something about somebody else? If you break down the word, it means you make an ass out of me and you. Oh, anyway. But if we define a stranger, we are think indulging in even more bizarre behavior without even thinking about it. Very often people do just that. They approach others backwards, defining them from the outside in. We'll look at some specific backwards approaches in a moment so we can see just how strange they are.
Assuming that some people are exposed to a backwards way of relating in childhood and emulate it until it becomes a habit, then it is reasonable to assume that if it were only a learned behavior, as hard as it is to unlearn something, these people could. So, like we say, if you're told that, you know, you're this out of control child and blah, 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 and you were so hard on your mother that she had to start selling a product because without this product, she couldn't, she couldn't have gotten up today and dealt with you and whatnot. And then if you're the other one that, oh, you're so medically complex that, you know, you're so hard on your mother. So one was sick and one was out of control and both had nothing to do with the fact that they were being Put in solitary confinement, you know, just crazy. Back to my book. Sorry, I keep just having these thoughts as I read, you know. I got Watts syndrome. Certainly a person would apologize if what they were doing were pointed out to them. If they could understand or see what they'd done. If they didn't want to look silly, act delusional, or inadvertently cause harm. But many people find it extremely difficult to break the habit of defining people, whether they are strangers or not. Recall the man who asked, why can't I take it, the good behavior, 10 minutes down the road to his wife and his family? He seemed to feel unable to do this. Possibly his oppressive behavior was actually more than just a habit. It seems that it had something to do with his way of being with his wife and his family, his sense of closeness to them, just the opposite of one that one might imagine. Let's look at some backwards approaches and see if we can see how making up another person relates to closeness, bonding, and connection. We begin our explanation, our exploration by taking a close look at how someone can approach another person backwards long before a bond or connection is established. A little side note here from Tabitha Jane. I was working, you know, I was like 19 years old. And I was working in a place kind of like a Chipotle, okay? And this little hussy comes in. And I wore very practical jeans that I'd gotten on clearance. And yes, they were purple. And my crew neck t-shirt with my practical turtleneck under and my practical Hanes bra and my practical granny panties and my practical shoes to work. And my hair was in a French bay, a French braid every day. And that's how I was. And this hussy comes in. She's wearing like these sandals and these tight, tight crop jeans. Her hair's in a French twist. She's not wearing anything under her shirt and it's low cut. She's wearing beautiful lipstick, jewelry. Now she was just hired to come in from the 12 to two, you know, just to do the cashiering. We needed something just for that. So she wasn't, you know, getting in the grease vats like I was and everything, you know, so she could come in and look pretty and walk away pretty. So you know what? I defined her as some damn hussy that had no stress in her life and somebody that I would not be friends with at all because I was a hard worker and I had bought a house when I was 18 and I had had my child when I was 16 and still graduated and she didn't know hardship right and I mean I was just giving her these dirty looks right I wasn't gonna like her at all so she starts being nice to me and again I had defined her you know as this hussy Mm -hmm. then she like keeps talking and she won't shut up and I'm like uh huh whatever whatevs <laughs> and then she tells me that you know like she has like a 15 year old or whatever I'm like what yeah she had her child when she was 14 when she was 16 and that this job was one of the three that she had. Because she had to have three jobs over a 24-hour period so that she could be able to drive her two girls to school and pick them up. 
and she was a single mom. And I was apparently the asshole. And we're still best friends to this day. But it's funny, you know, 30 years on, you know, that, you know, I just adore her. And I defined her. And I was wrong. And I was just so jealous. And she worked on me and, and um, bought me some underwear that clearly did not have the kind of underwear lines that I was um, trying to crunch into my jeans and have my granny fanny underwear coming out of the top and everything. You know, apparently those granny panty lines were very... Um, unattractive so she brings me she buys me a bunch of french cut underwear i'm like i don't know which side is the front or back on these ma'am could you tell me and, and she gave me a bunch of her old bras and stuff you know and they were real cute and lacy and not the practical kind that i had worn and she worked on me and she gave me a little makeover and i started looking a little bit more um attractive shall we say lost the turtlenecks occasionally gave a little cleavage she really worked on me and it was good because i um, I was very drab. I was a, kind of a shrew, and she she worked on me. She just showed me, you know, I didn't need to be that um, that weird at my age of twenty. So it was just funny, and she was generous, and she's got a sense of style, and she's just amazing, just an amazing person. But like I say, I defined her, and I was wrong. But I did it, and now I'm back to the book. The Smile Story Not long ago, I was concentrating on my plans for a trip to Manhattan when I, well, I poured my coffee from a golden urn in the lobby of a lovely hotel near New York City. Suddenly, I heard someone who seemed to be talking to me. Standing just behind me and to the right, I turned and saw a stranger. No one else was there. It must have been me to whom he was speaking. I asked, smile, what? Smile, it's a nice day, he said very emphatically. What, I asked again, incredulous and taken aback. Smile, it's a nice day, he said even more emphatically. Nearly speechless, I said, what, again? And what he was saying had nothing to do with me. My mind was filled with the thoughts of the public transportation schedule and directions to the bus and how close the drop-off point was to my desired destination. As I stood there, another what still lingering on my lips, he stopped his loud demands and walked away. I had noticed that the name tag showed that he was a member of the convention I had spoken to the day before. So, trying to connect me, connect with me by trying to make me smile as if the expression on my face could be different, as if he was privy to my thoughts and feelings and knew what it should be, as if he could define me, as if this made him closer to me as if defining me was a way of connecting? Did the stranger who had demanded my smile believe that he was or could be so close to me that he could tell me how to be? So close that in a harmless but backwards way he was privy to my inner reality? As innocuous as his approach was, it was one I could not emulate. I had never approached a stranger or even someone I knew well and demanded a smile. The very next morning in the same hotel, another interesting event unfolded. The you read too much story. In a restaurant, several people left a table not far from the table where I was sitting, reading a newspaper Well eating breakfast. Very strangely, like the morning before, I suddenly heard someone talking to me just behind me, but this time to the left. What? 
I asked, looking up to meet the gaze of another stranger. You read too much, he said brusquely. What? I asked, more incredulously than the morning before. You read too much, he repeated awkwardly. What? I asked again, while I struggled to grasp the meaning of this man's strange declaration. Seeming to have embarrassed himself, he mumbled something like, they're up ahead, and headed up after them. I saw his name tag, though, and realized he was also a member of the convention where I'd spoken. Possibly he, too, was trying to connect with me by telling me that I read too much, as if what I was doing, compared to what, was excessive, as if we were so close that he were privy to my thoughts, feelings, and even to my reading habits, and I knew what I should be doing, as if he could define me as if defining me were a way of connecting. What would explain these strange approaches? In both instances, I was told something about my inner reality before I was asked about it. It seems that some unaware, well-meaning, hardworking people will intending to connect with us may instead do the opposite. When trying to make a connection or strike up a conversation, or get to know us, they approach us backwards. People disconnect from us the moment they begin to define us. They begin to connect with us when they define themselves to us or ask about ourselves. That's how we get to know them and how they get to know us. It doesn't work the other way around. For instance, I might have had a conversation with the man who said, you read too much, if he'd instead said something like, excuse me if I'm interrupting, I'm blank. I And I was wondering about blank. Do you have a minute? I don't think these two strangers meant to startle me or throw me off balance. They simply acted as if they could define me. In the first case, I didn't explain why I wasn't smiling. And in the second, I didn't feel I could defend the fact that I was reading. But if I had, wouldn't I have given the impression that someone could connect with me? But in a backwards way, wouldn't I have given approval to another person's taking one tiny step across my psychic boundary? Wouldn't my ex explanation or defense suggest to the intruder that he was right in thinking we're so close? I know that she should be because she, sh she is in fact explaining why in this case she doesn't agree. Her explanation suggests that in some cases I do know how she could be. Could a subtle step across the boundary be a way to check out the possibility of a bigger step? Many times I have heard people reflect upon a poor relationship saying, if I'd only seen those little signals and recognized them for what they were, a glimpse of the controlling personality. Hmm. I told the read too much story to a woman who had once been in a battering relationship. She had been in training for many years to question herself. Even now, after seven years of freedom, when she heard my story, she said, if right now I heard you read too much, I would have either wondered if I did or wondered why I give the impression that I did. If person isn't told what is wrong with them or how they should be, they may define themselves in even more subtle manner. A client told me that he found that he was con constantly explaining himself to a seemingly loving mate who, though adamant about her affections, paradoxically claimed to know his every motive. Furthermore, she objected to all of his attempts to define himself. Speaking of his wife, he gave the following account. Yesterday, she said, you bought that print because of the colors. I said, no, I saw it as a study in contrasts. Then she said, I know the colors are your favorites. You just like to argue. Of course I objected. 
I told her I hate arguing. The whole thing turns my stomach. I feel like I'm under constant attack and that I have to explain my position on everything. When I was reading last night, she said, you sure go for female sleuths. I said, that's not it. And explained that I had just finished a mystery last week that I had a male detective and that I just enjoy mysteries. Why can't she show some interest in me? Why can't she ask me what I like best about a painting, for example? Or a book, for that matter? I feel like I'm drowning in her definitions of me. Almost like I have to explain my very existence. A side note here. Who did y'all think of? Do you guys remember that story of C.W. when he said that he couldn't even have any say in anything of the decor. What do you say? He was able to pick like one painting or something. I mean, it was like something so bizarre that all of his money went to every single thing. But yet he couldn't even say, what was that? It was, like, he couldn't even say where a picture needed to be hung. And I mean, I see, you know, the other side of it. And men don't know how to decorate a house. There has to be a happy medium. Like, my husband's office looks like he vomited the 80s all over everything. And I commented the other day about how we need to make sure that we have curtains on the French doors that go to his office so that in the event somebody comes over, we can be sure to shut those French doors so that no one sees his office Pretty much have decorated the whole rest of the house. So I can kind of see myself in that situation. And how SW and CW were. But the thing is, is that I actually let people use the things that I have. And the way that they're decorated. So that things can be put back when they're done. And there's some semblance of order. She had everything the way that she liked it because she had the house, the brick house, the house she had built, the little castle in North Carolina, a brick castle. She got very accustomed to it. She would have just been very happy to have lived by herself in an immaculate home that she funded by all means necessary even if they were of the oldest profession however it was in this politically correct world where no one can feel left behind and whatnot, and that everybody needs to be accepted no matter what I hope that the prostitutes stand up and unite because I have never seen it on a job resume for all the people I've hired and fired. I've never seen anybody put on a job resume. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of skills that the ladies of the night have. Just saying, let's go there. Anyway, anyway, Like I say, when she said she couldn't have kids, those were the most true words she ever spoke. In fact, maybe the only true words she ever spoke. What she said when she was saying she couldn't, she meant it. She meant that she could not. She couldn't handle kids. She didn't want kids. No matter what anybody tries to say in her brother trying to say that, you know, she was a hero by carrying those children and whatnot, those children were not loved. They were objects of her to define and for her to make martyrs of herself and it's very sad. Very sad. Well, anyway, back to the book. In relationships, people usually try to explain themselves so that their significant other will know them. But this particular significant other approached her partner backwards. Mm. 
People who find themselves in similar circumstances often believe that people who define them are rational and simply have made an assumption and will stop making assumptions as soon as they're told that their assumptions are false. This works with some people, but to a person whose identity is built backwards, explanations carry only the message that in this case you are wrong. It is okay to define me, but not in this particular particular way. The act of defining others is justified, rational, and not part of a let's pretend world. When I was told on one occasion to smile and on another that I read too much, I wasn't influenced to wonder if I should be different, smile more, or read less. Nor did I suffer harm, nor did I explain myself. I was too surprised to do so. On the other hand, as bizarre as the comments were, if they had been made by a family member, I might have thought I could explain how inappropriate they were so that he or she would better understand me. Although backwards approaches may seem like a small thing or easy to deal with, nothing compared to violence, gangs, and other pressing relationship issues A backwards approach is like a whiff of smoke from a distant fire, something we may ignore until it is so close that it threatens to consume us. Backwards approaches, at best, reveal fuzzy thinking and at worst create devastating problems. I have found that people who cannot accept, feel, or even conceptualize their inner experiences not only make up themselves from the outside, but also approach others in the same way making them up from the outside in, not even noticing that they are doing so. While anyone may, in moments of forgetfulness, tell another person who, what, or how they are or should be, or what they should do, I have met people in every walk of life who do this as a matter of course. People who say things like, men are all pigs, or women should, you know, these doesn't say things I just said. It. These statements define nearly half of the world's population all at once. I remember in my own childhood, a neighbor who defined people. When she would see what appeared to be a student on her way to the local college, she would say, "Huh. Well, doesn't she think she's smart going to college?" It seems a silly thing to do. Why this kind of behavior is so common that people who indulge in it don't even seem embarrassed. It's just the way that it is, that some people defining others is to be expected or not worth further thought. And I don't think so. I believe that it's worth our consideration because it is of consequence to every one of us. Other people's definitions of us are not just absurd. If unchallenged, they erect prison walls around us. As they rise higher, the light of awareness fades. The world darkens. We lose freedom, safety, confidence, conviction, and sometimes even ourselves. In the very act of defining another person, one consciously, unconsciously plays God. Wow, that's, that's a concept. Yeah, you are playing God when you define someone. That's that's interesting. At the extreme, don't people who play tyrant dictator or oppressor play god yeah they do playing god is not uncommon and it's not always noticed we have yet to see a world in which people do not make up people we have not even come close senses of disconnection are many and profound they are pertinent to our problems our daily struggles to live in a world of justice and freedom They are problematic for a person who, after being disconnected from his or herself, wants to connect with another person. That's really interesting. And that is our chapter 10. I have a funny story of um, being defined that I will share with you right now. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) this is terrible. In um, our neighborhood chat, we have a little neighborhood chat on our Facebook, and uh, 
It said. <laughs> it said. I was, I was walking my dog and I saw a man dressed in all black walking around. Maybe a vulnerable adult just speaking incoherently. Something was wrong. So I got my dog in and I. I went and got my truck and I drove around the neighborhood to try and see if I could see him again because I don't know if he's unsafe. I don't know if he wandered into somebody's yard. I just want everybody to be really careful. Well, a few minutes later, <laughs> neighbor says, oh, hi, that's my dad. Yeah, he's a Catholic priest. And after dinner, he likes to walk while he says his nightly prayers. <laughs> but that's how it is you know this guy is like out with his dog sees somebody dressed all in black talking all loud and this man to find that man is all all dressed in black talking incoherently probably a vulnerable adult <laughs> Well, meanwhile, as a Catholic priest saying his nightly prayers as he's walking off dinner. <laughs> oh, I just thought it was so funny. I just thought it was, it was just, you know, and that's that's how defining somebody else, you know, especially when they're not in their um, normal habitat. You know, if you define somebody behaving in a certain way out of where you would normally see them. You see how it would happen. You know, if you're if you're going to church and you see this man up, you know, dressed all in black, talking, perhaps incoherently, you know that it's the priest babbling about something. <laughs> My gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh I mean in in the, the neighbor was nice about she oh mine's my dad it wasn't like oh my gosh because here's this person here's this guy saying the other in an <laughs> incoherent possibly vulnerable adult <laughs> It's dangerous to define others and it's, it's dangerous to define our children, especially, you know, when you make one child feel that they are less than one child feel that they are the sick one. And this, this one is the wild one, you know, um, it, I think that it, it is said best when, um, you are told that your children are essentially, um, a blank chalkboard, a, a whiteboard. And that whatever you say to them is what they hear and is written on them. And that's, that's what they see when they look in the mirror. And so be careful of what you say to your children because you may label them. And if your words aren't spoken with love and building your child up, they may see the words that you've marked on their, their whiteboard. I mean... It's very dangerous telling somebody what they are. Not to even attempt to go down the road to say, what kind of a couple were a shenanigan Chris? Was there true intimacy? If even in their sex life, he knew that she wanted sex because she'd take a shower and she wore condoms. Whereas she's telling everybody else that she's infertile because of her lupus. Not saying that they're using condoms. Um, Cause that would, if used correctly, prohibit a pregnancy. But she liked the um, the sympathy and the attention of 
Oh, no, she can't get pregnant. She didn't want anybody to mess up her house. I mean, if she was saying that they couldn't have children, that makes this big house the same as when she was just alone and had the big house. I mean, when I had my, my beautiful little condo, it was that. It was little. It was a one bedroom. Um, one bedroom, one bath. My kids lived with their dad and we wanted it that way. So I'd stay in the same school, same, same home, everything like that, you know, so I'd go over, or take them out, you know, go and, and grab them, whatnot. I mean, I lived in a, you know, in the Seattle area, so things were expensive. But, um, so it wouldn't have made, I couldn't have afforded to have went and got, you know, another entire house until I got remarried, blah, 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 blah. But we did what I needed to do. So the kids had stability, no matter how the relationship ended with their father. And I didn't see that Shanann was capable of putting her children first ever. That she was so incredibly selfish. And I saw the opposite in Christopher. That he was the one reading the books. That he was the one sitting on the floor playing games with them. That he was the one carrying them on his body as he mowed the lawn, as he did the dishes and whatnot. Because she couldn't be bothered. And that's where in my head I know that the Christopher Watts would be in the same vernacular as O.J. Simpson and Casey Anthony. And Colorado did not want that. And they did a dirty deed in the way that they did this. And like I say, it'll be interesting to see the way that it comes out. And I don't think that a mock trial can be done until all of the facts and the truth are there. Because a mock trial, a mock trial would be a good thing if the facts and the truth are there. Until they're there, it, you can't. And I don't think that Christopher is able or was able to properly emote what was really happening. I'm not the first person to suspect that he may have a sensory processing um, disorder or um, possibly even be on the spectrum of autism. His emotions um, seem very hmm, constipated. I don't know if you can have constipated emotions. Well, that's kind of how I think that he is. His emotions are kind of constipated. And they just weren't a good couple. She needed him. She needed a ticket out of town fast because she was looking at a criminal conviction for embezzlement. She used him. He went along with it. He was loyal. But is he guilty? of ending the lives of four people. Then we go back to, we go back to the story of the, you know, the, the university. Did Christopher go into a rage? Did he have enough time to go into a rage? If he didn't do it, how does he know that they were in the tanks? If he just went off in a snap decision and ended her life, and the initial story he said where she had done that, why didn't he call 911? When they evaluated him, as they do for prisoners, to see how, what kind of a prisoner they're going to be, who to match them with, etc. What did his psychological announcement or, or evaluation say? I know that he told um, Sherlyn Cradlecrap that he was determined to be very intelligent. And he was very, very proud of that. But what did that say? What's the other side of that? I mean, what did it say? 
have a hard time knowing that he was sneaking food to the girls when she had coldly locked them up. He was the one listening to their needs. He was the one meeting their needs. He was the one doing the care. He was the one caring for them. So he was caring. He had emotions. He had empathy. So how could he have done this? What was in those stupid stickers? And was it wise to put on two? I know there was some system or whatever that one goes on and then the other to boost or whatever. But what was in them and why did they change the formula? What if with his individual makeup of genetics that that much caffeine what if that made him go psychotic what if he was psychotic what what was in his blood why didn't they take his blood what are we missing was there somebody else there that night Can we prove without a shadow of a doubt that he did this and did it by himself in that time frame? No, we can't. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that I love you guys all so much. And I hope that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And that um, you all woke, wake up in the morning with a turkey hangover. And this should be uploaded for your afternoon. Um, and maybe you're celebrating with Black Friday deals, and I am just so thankful that I am not working in retail, and I am not in retail management and having to deal with the freaking Black Friday drama from hell. And that's one time when I was working. Our store was open Thanksgiving, because why not, right? A few years ago greedy, greedy world. The pandemic hadn't hit. Why not be open on frickin' Thanksgiving? So, we have these Black Friday deals. Doorbusters. This group of people wanted their doorbusters. And they were looking around for them. But they weren't going to be out till the next day. And so they started swarming me. And following me around and watching what I was putting out and watching my signage and whatnot. And they wanted these, 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 these door busters so bad. And they would not leave me alone. And, and they were male. And they kept calling on their cell phones to get these other males. And they were following me around like freaking sharks. And I would go and check on my employees and whatnot. And, you know, and they'd be like, my God, why are these men following you around I'm like because they want their freaking door busters and I told them that it's tomorrow they're gonna have to wait and they're watching me because they think that I have the goods and I don't have the goods and so I I couldn't even get into the I couldn't even do like the closing duties I couldn't give it or go over to the freaking safe where the safe is freaking concealed and whatnot because these freaking men wouldn't leave me the fuck alone and they're following me all around and they wanted my name and they wanted this and that. And, you know what I mean? I was just like, oh, my God. And I was down at, like, the only other manager in the whole freaking store. I'm trying to get it closed down, you know, get everything all done and everything. And like I said, I couldn't even, you know, do the money counts and whatnot because I didn't want them to see it and walk, walk around with cash and all that good stuff. And uh, so then they would, like, ask other managers. I just talked to, you know, um, information about me and stuff like that. So then they were, you know, going around and calling my name and stuff and asking everybody about me and what time I was going to come in the next day. And oh my God, right? So I get in the next day for Black Friday. And the big glob of them was there pushing and shoving along with everybody else. And they were screaming my name and all this. And it accusing me of committing fraud and whatnot because the item wasn't there. Well, greedy ass corporate store that I worked at had about 10 of those items. And there were no, no less than probably 50 of those men wanting that certain item. And they were screaming at me. And they were going to get my job and all this stuff. And they were angry, very angry. 
So I yeeted it into the elevator <laughs> and ran into the back room and climbed up on a ladder as high as I could. <laughs> and went up into this little, like, little crawl space area there and cried and cried and cried. And cried. And cried. And I think I had a panic attack. And cried and cried some more. And then I got on my walkie and got the store manager and told him what was going on. And security reviewed the footage and everything. And they're like, my God. My God, it's a mob. It's a mob and it wants to kill you. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't have the freaking goods. Those was in this advertisement. Shitty, stupid thing. That is in there as one of the blockbusters. And our store like literally had like 10 of that the mob of people that got in before had already grabbed them. And these people wanted to freaking tear me limb for limb. And I wouldn't come back out. I just sat there in the back and got stocked down and handed it to everybody to bring out. I'm like, I'm not going back out there. No way. No how. No. And everybody pretty much agreed, like, yeah, they, they want to, the angry mob wants to kill you. Like, yeah, I know. I know. And I was just like, it's disgusting. It's greed. And any store that's open on Thanksgiving or Christmas, Christmas Day, I would never support. It's just not worth it. Not at all. And it wasn't right or fair what happened to me. But... I look at Thanksgiving a lot differently. And like I say, that's my biggest thanks. Thank you that I am not being swarmed by angry men wanting a stupid door buster. It was like a shitty cologne. A shitty cologne and a little thing. And that was worth it to them. Terrifying. But anyway... I think it's good because most stores are doing their um, Black Friday stuff early now and online because I think it's just too dangerous. There's there's nothing to me that's worth being in line and fighting and pushing for. Not at all. Like no. I don't. I don't need it. I don't want it. You know. So with that, I'll let you go. Um, let me know if you had turkey or ham. Let me know your theories. On Idaho and everything else, Watts Islandish. And my email address is Tabitha Jane Zero at gmail.com. You know, you send me something. It may take me six months to get back to you, but I will get back to you. Because I know a lot of people, you know, want to say things that they don't want other people to see in the comments. And I totally agree. And that's what I do too, you know, when I email another creator. Um, I like to just message, you know, so we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. So, everybody have a great weekend. And I will do this again soon. And it's been lovely to talk to y'all. All right, signing off now. Bye-bye.